me tell you about Kay Gabby. Kay is an alcohol and other drug project coordinator working on opioid abuse prevention. She has 25 years experience working in multi-agency collaborative prevention programs in schools, nonprofits, foundations, and universities and community colleges, like the Neighborhoods Small Grants Program, Community Profile, PRO Neighborhoods, Pima Prevention Partnership Initiatives, and the Pima County City of Tucson Commission on Addiction Prevention and Treatment. She's busy. She's doing some great work out there. She holds degrees in cultural anthropology and human services administration and community youth development. She has extensive training as a grant writer, facilitator, trainer, teacher, and speaker. And we're delighted to have her here to share her passion with us. Please welcome Kay Godby. Good morning. So great to see you. You know, my most impressive credential is that I was a substitute teacher, I think. Because honestly, that was the hardest job I think I ever had, was being a substitute teacher. And honestly, I'm going to start with this. I know none of you are in, none of you teach in the middle schools, right? You do? Awesome. Special place in heaven just for you. Um, yeah. That's just awesome. So anyway, uh, I want to talk today about, um, about some cool stuff. We're going to talk about how do we create environments, how, are, how do we become mindful of the work that we do so that the work that we do doesn't just run us into the ground, so that we end up doing things that are meaningful and that actually create change. And sometimes that means asking ourselves some difficult questions. But before we do that, there's me. Just in case you were you know, concerned that you wouldn't know who was the right person, that's me. Um, and so how did I come to t talk about this topic? As, uh, as was mentioned, um, I started out in anthropology and was studying cultures. Um, I started way before that in psychology, and I thought, this isn't for me. I'm not the most empathetic person. I need to move out of this. But what I really was interested in is the way that the fabric of society, our culture, supports ourselves. And when we have roles in that culture um, and have meaningful connections, it makes a difference in our behavior and our um, and how we act. And so a lot of what I have done and, and researched over the years is related to that, and it's connected tied specifically to um, substance misuse, unhealthy behaviors, essentially coping habits that we have for ourselves when we're trying to figure out how do we navigate a society that we either do or don't fit into. So the work that we do, before I get started and asking what our work is about, why don't I get a little bit of notice can you all go, um, I'm here this morning, and then I'm going to say I'm here this morning. And if you're here this morning, too, say, that's me. Just wave your arms, shout, that's me. If you're an introvert, you don't feel comfortable doing that, just close your eyes and squeeze yourself in tight. All right, so I'm going to say I'm here this morning. That's me. Awesome, you got the growth. I uh, work in prevention. That's me. I teach. Awesome. Um, I work in a college setting. That's me. I work out in the community. That's me. I volunteer. That's me. I'm passionate about young people. That's me. Awesome. Okay. So now I know who you are. Now you're in big trouble. So let's talk about our work and the work that we do. We have to agree that our work is not really about making posters. OK? Our work is not about making posters. It's not about having endless meetings. <laughs> right? So I'm sorry. It's just not about that. Yeah, I know, right? Is it about putting on events? Is that what our work is on? Maybe, but not really. Our work is really about what? Students. Students, connecting people, right? It's about change. 
transformation, becoming facilitators of other people's change and our own change within that. Okay, so if our work is really about change, let's not talk about how we can have more meetings, right? Let's talk about how we inform change in a way that is productive is gonna end up with happier, healthier people, right? And so what types of activities lead to greater sustainable change? All right, and so I've got, this is old school, man. This is going back to some of the work I was doing in community developing back in like the late 80s. That's how old this tool is, okay? And so what we see is awareness and motivational events, so or emo, awareness or motivation activities, right, actually lead to the less effective outcomes across the board with change. Right? So if you come and I say, and I don't, how many of you heard this? If everybody just had all the facts, they would, they would change. <laughs> right? How many of us said this? Right? Well, well, let's make a poster and tell everybody about everything. Right? So does, that, does this be, end up in community change? Does this change personality changes? Do we make changes? We're gonna talk about that. Education, slightly more effective, right? Grassroots engagement, now we're starting people to, to be a part of the discussion of making their own change. And actually, that actually informs some, um, some real change. We begin to see more effective change. In between there, before you get to environmental shifts, you have some policy change. We don't get a chance to do a lot of policy enactment here, but policy can change environment. And then we see very effective, sustainable change happens when our environment shifts. And sometimes that has to do with systemic changes, like the systems that we're in, the institutions that we're in. And sometimes that happens with just an environmental shift. For example, you're driving down the road and there are big orange cones and a big arrow. You might drive the exact same way to work every single day, but then you get on a detour. And what happens if you find on that detour you really like that detour better than the way you used to go? And so now the road's fixed and everything's great, but you're like, you know, I kind of like that detour. And so you start that detour from then on. An environmental shift automatically changes behavior. So I want you to keep that in your minds as we move forward and think about how we use our resources, okay? Any questions so far? We good? So when we talk about motivation, we talk about the activities that we do. I often think of um, wristbands, right? Uh, the wristbands that say, don't do drugs, okay? A lot of people are like, all right, what are we going to do? We got to do this. Don't, we got we to stop people doing drugs. We're going to spend all of our budget on wristbands. Everybody's going to get wristbands. A wristband for you, and a wristband for you, and a wristband for you. So awareness and motivational activities never are enough to make sustainable change. So let's talk about why that is. Really, people are ambivalent about change. All of us. We're all ambivalent about some change. Does anyone have a voice in their head that's saying, I should really do more something? I should, I should exercise more. I should stop eating so many donuts. I, yeah. <laughs> right? Absolutely. So there are all kinds of things. But you know what? The donut, it's so beautiful. Right? So I, I like, you know, I love bacon. And I know every study, I see them all, I'm a health educator. They come out with study after study saying the nitrates are gonna kill you and the bacon's so salty and it's so fatty, it's so bad. And then I'm in the buffet line and I'm like, but bacon, <laughs> right? So I can know and be aware of all of this stuff, but if I'm still ambivalent about my love for bacon, right? It's hard for me to let go of that. 
I'm ambivalent. I hold on to two feelings at the same time. On one side, I want this awesome body to just keep rocking till I'm 120. And on the other hand, Bacon has an emotional attachment to me and my family and my life and everything else. Right? I'm ambivalent. Yes and no at the same time. We're this way about every change in our lives. And how do we move from an old action to a new action? For me, I talk about bacon a lot, and I talk about how awful it is, and I think about the cancer connection. And for me, ever since I started talking about bacon, I've eaten less and less bacon. It works for me. I'm just don't, you know, just let me go with that. So what's at the core of our ambivalence? Often it's that mismatch, that conflict that we have, perhaps between our own priorities, but perhaps it's between the priorities of ourselves and the other people around us who might have control over us, right? I want to party every night. My professor wants me to do my homework. And you know, there's a mismatch there. My mom thinks that I should get good grades. Right? But at the same time, that's not as important as connecting with people my own age. Right? So there's this mismatch. And so my mom thinks my education is the most important thing in my life. And I think my education might be number five. Right? So whenever there's that mismatch and someone's trying to talk to me, I'm going to put up some resistance. And what I'm really trying to get at is ambivalence is really normal. We all feel it. Exploring our own ambivalence helps us identify and remove the things that are getting in the way of our making a change. So that bacon thing, until I started to realize, oh yeah, that connects me to my family. That I, I have memories of breakfast together. Like until I look at that, I don't realize why I keep gravitating towards that bacon. Once I can look at it, I go, you know, my health is more important than those memories. And I can get that with eggs or pancakes or whatever else. Uh, resolving that ambivalence helps us move towards that change that we're looking for. All right? But this is what doesn't work. Pushing your values onto other folks is not a recipe for change. OK? And I, can everybody read that? Yeah. yeah. So I love this kid because if any of you have kids, you've totally been here where they're like, don't do that, it's fine, right? But I found myself as an educator, really, someone comes to me and I, I, I'm like, well, school is the most important thing. Right? And I'd be trying to tell them all these different choices and ways they could get better in class. And I was missing the boat completely. And the minute that came out of my mouth, this is the most important thing in your life, what happened? That's exactly right. What, go ahead and say that out loud. They just shut me out. Oh, you're my mom. Click. Right? I don't have to listen to you anymore. Or if, they have, if they're uh, children of divorced parents generally, they're super good at this. Oh, yes. They're going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. And you're going to think, I did such a great job today. Right? They're going to walk out and forget every single thing you said. So step number two in our success line right, for effective change, education. The idea that I can throw a bunch of facts at you and then you're going to change your behavior is obviously not true. I know a lot about physiology, I know a lot about the body, and yet, bacon, right? So I look at this and I think, facts alone, they only support people who already share my goals. If I said bacon is bad, there's going to be a percentage of people in this room who are like, I told you so. I've been telling you for years that that's right, right? And they're going to be all on board, right? And there are other people in the room who are ambivalent, just like I am. And there are other people in the room who are not even going to hear it because they know bacon's good for you secretly. <laughs> <laughs> they know that that's true. And why do they know that? Because they have what's called confirmation bias. And we all are subject to confirmation bias. Not one of us is immune to this. And this is, the inte this is what happens when we hear only what we want to hear. 
This is why I go with my husband to the doctor. Because when we're in that office and the doctor gives him the instructions, he hears exactly the parts of the instructions that he wants to hear, right? So when the doctor says, don't eat bacon, he hears bacon, comes home and says, I got to go to the store and buy more bacon. Right? And so we only hear what confirms what is going to connect to our pre existing beliefs. And we see this borne out in a million different ways in social media. And, and, our, and it, with social media, it actually is trained to increase this confirmation bias, right? There are actually things, anytime you choose something, you're like, oh, you like that? Here's 10 more of that. I can support your belief in that. Here you go, right? So all of a sudden, not only do you have confirmation bias, but your systems are just feeding you the things that feed into that confirmation bias, and that grows and grows. Right? And so it doesn't help to give someone who doesn't think they need to change a lot of facts because they're not going to hear the things that you want them to hear. They're going to hear what they want to hear. So we have to be aware that that's the case. And sometimes education alone can actually stop us from making effective behavior change with people. That's important for educators to hear. It was important for me to hear. And this is the other piece. And if you've ever talked to someone who is into marijuana, you can see this happen. If people counter-argue information vigorously enough, right, they're going to double down on that initial belief. They might have been kind of ambivalent about something in the beginning, but when, they, when you set up a place where you're arguing with someone, they're going to just dive down deeper into that belief, and they're going to believe it even more at the end of that debate, right, than they did at the beginning. So beware of setting up situations where people are fighting against you for information or knowledge, right? Um, be prepared for people to do this. Right? So what's going to happen is I'm going to throw education at you. You're going to take all those facts and say, but you're wrong. These are the things I believe, and throw your counter back at me. Right? And, and the more you counter argue, the more you think, yeah, I'm right. Right? And so did we do an effective behavior change? <laughs> no. But sometimes when we think, what do we need to do? Let's do posters and let's do education. We don't think we might be doing the absolute worst thing we can do. So what can we do? What's feeding the drive for all of these activities, these poster making activities, these educational meetings? What's driving that stuff for low level outcomes? I'm asking, what do you think? What? History. History. You've done it before, that's what everybody does. Yes, what else? Time. It doesn't take any time at all to make a poster. It takes a lot of time to change environments and structure. It hurts people's egos, right? It's super easy, it's low hanging fruit, man. Buy a couple bracelets and all our problems are solved. Right? So. Why do we invest in this? We also have kind of a, um, a misunderstanding about how human nature works. And we like to just believe that that's going to that's gonna be enough. We like to believe that all people need is a little bit of facts. And they will, just by the goodness of their own hearts, change. Right? We like to believe that. We'd like to believe it about ourselves. So I've got a little thing. I brought some shot glasses to show you, but I'm, I've been talking too much, so I'm going to roll right through this. But I want you to be leery of goal displacement. And that's when the, goal, when the means, so the activities, the, the bracelets, the, the fairs, right? When those begin to displace the original goals, which was behavior change in the first place, right? And, and successful behavior. When we start saying, hey, you know, um, I, there was a program 
at Emory Riddle that I worked with, and and uh, 200 years ago they used to. It wasn't really 200 years. I'm exaggerating, but long ago they had had an arts program, and they were going to do an arts night, and it was a lot of work for the administration, and nobody would come. And so I came in and I said, we need to do an arts night and it needs to be the student driven and it needs to be awesome and we need to have it. And they said, oh no, we've done that before. We don't want to do that anymore. And I'm like, well, that's cool, but I don't care. And so then, <laughs> so then what I did was I put it in the students and I recruited the students that I found practicing their instruments around the campus. And I said, hey, I think we should have an open mic night. And they're like, yeah, because performers want to perform. And if they don't have an outlet to perform, they're really missing out, right? They practice and practice and practice and don't get a chance to perform. And performing gives you an opportunity, right? As a performer, when we get to connect with people, that's what we're about. You know, it's not just playing the instrument, that's cool, but performing gives us a connection to our community. So we created this amazing event, you know, where we had, we had all kinds of art. You know, once the students got into it, they're like, it's not enough to have an open mic night. We need to have this and we need to engage them. And we brought in the community from the outside and we had artists come and bring their art. And it was an amazing night. Amazing. And then, the next time we had it, it was amazing. And then the next time we kind of passed it over to another person who institutionalized it and they made a uh, department for the music and that guy was in charge of it and he had a lot on his plate just organizing the bands and keeping the music groups up and doing all this other thing. And what happened was, the goal of engaging community for community's sake and engaging them in art became somebody's task to do an event and it was easier to just run it and do it and follow the thing and make it happen than it was to engage all these students in designing what, what they loved and what they wanted. And what happened the next time they gave the event? They had a few people come and the performers came, they performed and then they left. Right? So what happens is that we forget that the event was not the point. The point was building community. The point was engagement. Right? So we let that event totally displace our goal of having an open arts ex extravaganza. Right? So we have to be very careful because the bracelets can take it over. Oh, we used to do this kind of stuff, but now we got bracelets and that's easier. So we're just going to bring in the bracelets and forget about that other stuff. <laughs> right? And that's what happens. So if we get caught in our activity trap, right? It's the risk of becoming so busy with the activities, the meetings, the posters, the bracelets, that we forget what it was supposed to be doing in the first place. So without that strategic awareness, the presence of mind, the seduction powers of an activity trap, it just begins to choke off our ability for me reaching meaningful change. And we're all just going through the motions, not just us, but our students. We have to be mindful of the dragons. We're about to introduce some scary ideas. It's going to require change from everyone to move from just doing the posters and the meetings and the bracelets to doing transformational change is terrifying. It requires change on all of our parts, right? And so we've got some folks who are going to be resistant to that change. It's the nature of human beings. So we have to remember that they're there. Before we even go to approach them, we have to figure how are we going to wrap them in and make them part of this? How are they going to have a role in making this a difference that's meaningful to them? Right? We have to keep them in our mind or we're just going to be stuck with that administrator who says, nah, we've tried that in the past, it didn't work. Right? And so we have to say, okay, that per we went up to them, this is how they met us, how are we going to beat them next time? Next time we're going to say, hey, I need your advice on something. I heard you used to do this. What did work about that event? Would you like to be the chairperson of that part? Right? So you bring them in in any way that is. 
The other piece is you've got to target your audience where they are. And, and this is the key. People will support what they helped build. Right? And so if you brought that person in, all of a sudden they're the lead um, bracelet counter, right? And that's what they like because they really liked the bracelets. Okay, you can do bracelets. You count the bracelets, make sure you bring them. We want to put them front and center, right? They have a role, they're creating it, they're part of it. And then when they see the rest of the stuff that you've created, they're like, wow, maybe, maybe I want to be part of that too. Right, so the other thing is with the students, you can do to the students or you can have the students do, right? And by being part of the doing, yeah, and maybe it'll, maybe it'll fail. It doesn't matter because being part of the doing was the behavior change that we were looking for. Peer health programs, peer education programs, do you know the number one person that that changes their behavior sustainably from being a part of a peer education program. What is the only evidence change that's shown through those programs? Peer educators. Peer educators. They're the ones. 80% change or higher. Really high numbers. The people they're educating, do they have a very high experience? Not more than a teacher would. Not really much more change than it would be if anyone came in. Right? But for the peer educators, it's transformative. I was a peer health educator. Where am I? Right? So I mentioned the environmental shifts. You want to change the world? Start by changing the world. And I mean this in the smallest little way. Just by little things that just detour you from a different action. Right? Just by making it, um, for example, let's talk about cigarettes. By making cigarettes harder to steal, right, by putting them behind the counter, it made it harder for juveniles to run in and steal the cigarettes. Right? That was an environmental shift that changed the risk factors for the ease of access to cigarettes. It was huge. And it was a small environmental shift. We moved it from out in the front to up in the case. Right? So we can instill small changes even in our classroom. When we think about classroom flow, right? If I have all the tables facing the wall and the chairs facing the wall and everybody three feet apart, what does that do for flow of conversation in the classroom? It's isolating, right? It doesn't create good flow. It doesn't create good study, right? We know that by changing the environment in the classroom and playing around with it, we can get exactly what we want out of our students just by making an environment that's conducive to what we're trying to achieve, right? The same is true everywhere. If it's hard for me to get bacon, I'm not going to drive 10 miles out of my way to get bacon if I know that it's, I'm ambivalent about it already, right? If it's not at the buffet, I'm gonna eat more fruit and forget about the bacon. So environmental shifts. And so how many of you are familiar with stages of change? Prochaska, yes. Awesome, most of you. So good, when we think about the stages of change, we have to think about who we're targeting. Are we trying to change the folks who are, um, are involved in whatever activity we're trying to change? Are we trying to keep and support those folks who are already on board with us? Who are we targeting? And so we have this first stage, pre-contemplation, which is actually that stage where we don't even know that there's a problem that exists, right? And those folks don't, are just going blithely along. They're the ones who wear the t-shirts if the, you know, I, drinking problem, I drink, Get drunk, fall down, no problem. They wear the t-shirt, right? They don't, they don't rec recognize there's an issue with their behavior. However, if you start to have some problems with whatever is going on, so let's say my problem is um, I don't get to class on time, 
right? And it's never been a problem before because I'm a super genius and I'm good at taking tests, right? So for I've gone blithely along my life and then without any problem showing up about five minutes late to every class. It's never been a problem. Then all of a sudden the environment shifts and I'm getting in trouble for not showing up. And in fact, there's a class I'm taking that's really hard, it's space physics. And that class is so hard that if I miss even five minutes of that class, I could really hurt my grade, right? And I get my first test back and I go, oh, man, that sucks. And so I gotta think, maybe there's a problem with something that's going on. I'm contemplative, I'm thinking about Maybe this isn't the way it should be. Am I going to act on it? Maybe not right now. Maybe I need another test score to, to, to prove. Yeah, that's for sure. It's a problem. i got to change what I'm doing. And then I might move into preparation. I might think about, so what are the things that I'm doing that may not be contributing to this? What could I do differently? Well, maybe I could set my alarm a little different, or maybe I could do some other things. And I prepare to do those things, right? And then I move into action. I actually start doing those things. And once I start doing those things, maybe I get my first test back. And lo and behold, that test is amazing. And I was able to remember it, the things that my professor said, because I was actually there to hear them. Right? And so all of a sudden, my, my good behavior pays off. It's reinforced, and now I'm like, you know, I think I'm gonna do that for all my classes, for everything that I have, and I start to move into a place that's more maintenance, where I'm just doing it all the time. Will I slip? Will I relapse into whatever it is that I was doing before? Probably. But then I'll get consequences and I'll go, oh yeah, maybe I should go back to doing it what I had. And it's easier the next time because I've been in maintenance and I know what it feels like, okay? So these are essentially the stages of change, but we have to think of all of our students' behavior as everyone is on that continuum. And probably most of them are in the pre-contemplative place on whatever it is they're doing, right? And so when we think about how do we meet a pre-contemplator, is a bracelet gonna do it? is a bunch of education. Oh, well, you haven't been showing up to class. You know, if you just woke up earlier, you'd be able to make it to class. Well, you don't know me. Don't pour my cereal. You don't know how I am, right? So we've got to think about how do we reach them? Where are our resources going? Are they going into wristbands? Are they going into grassroots engagement that's connecting folks? Are they going into environmental shifts? When we look at who we're targeting versus who we're reaching, I don't know if you can read that. Can you? Oh, good. Yeah, you can read it. I can't read that, but, <laughs> but this is awesome. So I, I pulled this out. This is out of a, um, a webinar I saw recently. And this is just in prevention, so this is drug involvement. And uh, this is out of the, uh, the NIDA and the NIAAA research on uh, substance use for drug involvement for adolescents. And what we find is that 70% of students are really in this no past year substance use or infrequent substance use. Now, who works here? These are folks who are confirmed by your, your telling them that if you take too much drugs, that might affect your grades. These folks are the ones who are listening. It's important to feel and support them. I'm not saying stop sending the bracelets. What I'm saying is those people are on board Right? The folks who are struggling are up there in that yellow and orange. And if we're targeting them, we can't target them with bracelets and information. They're the pre-contemplators. They're not listening to our message. Right? Those folks are involved for whatever reason that is. And so we have to find a side door to talk with them. We have to find ways to engage them doing other things and then slide this messaging sideways. Okay, because a bracelet's not going to move them from pre-contemplation to action. It's not going to happen. Any questions or thoughts? I know it's a lot. I don't even know what time it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. And so how do we do it? 
How do we make all this stuff happen? We have these ideas, what we want to achieve, what we want to approach. How do we do it? We don't have any resources, right? And my experience is sometimes having resources can be more of a barrier than a help. What did you say? It can be triggering, but this is what I've found. I've found when everybody has to pitch in for the potluck, right? If I need you to bring your special lemonade, and I need you to bring your extra special casserole, and I've got to have you there because if you don't come with your um, pinata, we can't make it a party, right? And so all of you, all of a sudden, you have meaning, you have purpose, you have a reason to be at the table. And then I get a grant. And it allows for a budget for lemonade and, and pot roast and pinatas. So I'm just going to go buy them and bring them to the table. And I'm going to get a big special room. I got, I got money for this extra special room. So we don't have to meet at your house anymore, Judy. We're just going to meet in this special space. Right? Well, what happens? Exactly. We don't have any more involvement. Nobody else feels needed anymore. And all those resources that are super shiny and pretty are great, but they go to waste, right? So we have to, we have to be asset-based. We have to think, what do we have? What skills do we have at the table, right? If you're really good, and I know you are, at connecting and bringing people in, I'm not going to put you on bracelet counting duty. I'm going to put you at the front door. Because if I put you on bracelet counting duty, I'm standing on my ladder wrong. Right? I'm not using the resources that I have. When I don't pull in and give students the opportunity to use the talents they have and let those shine, I'm wasting an opportunity to connect with them and pull them into the community. By just providing them with what they need, oh, here's this, you don't ever have to think again. Right? Instead of saying, how should we challenge this? We have to be quick, creative, efficient, respectful of the folks that we have. But we really do. Sometimes overcoming adversity is part of the lesson we wanted them to get. You know, one of the things we really missed with this super controlling, keep your kids in the house and hyperactivity them, is that street play you learn a lot in unsupervised street play. A lot of independence, a lot of, we've missed a lot of social programming that happened just between the people on the street. The kids picking up sticks and going, how are we going to make a game out of this? You know? Start where we are, and this is an Arthur Ashe quote, I love it. Use what you can or use what you have and do what you can. Instead of waiting and saying, well, we can't do that program because we don't have a special room and we don't have all the resources for the cake and we can't buy this and we can't buy that, we don't do this, we have to start and reframe with, what do we got? We got excited, intelligent, interesting students. We have an amazing faculty that care. We've got some buildings. We've got some space. Let's make it work this way. We can't afford all the bracelets. Let's just have everybody make a wristband with some braided string. Right? And then all of a sudden, they're making the wristbands. Whoa, community engagement. It amped our program. And this I'm going to tell you because no one ever told me this until much later. You really have to imagine the dangers of your success. Not so that it'll stop you from doing anything, right? But sometimes the efforts that we make can cause repercussions that we need to be prepared for. And let me give you an example. At the University of Arizona, we had this problem. There were huge keg parties. And the keg parties were getting out of control. Right? And so we decided to create in Pima County a keg registration process. And you had to register if you were buying, you had to register your party. There was a whole rigmarole in getting involved in the keg process. Now, what do we know about uh, beer, which is usually in a keg? It has pretty low ethanol value. It's not a high ethanol content, right? 
So what happened here is that we made an environmental shift that made low ethanol alcohol difficult to get. What happened? They all switched to hard alcohol, right? And inst instead of drinking beer all night long, they drink hard alcohol and they binge quickly. So if you couldn't get the beer at the party, you would drink before you went. I'm going to get my BAC up to 0.35 and then I'm going to go out for the night. Right? I'm at a point two, and I'm headed out the door. And then if there's beer that comes my way or other alcohol, I'll drink that too during the night because I'm not using my frontal lobe anymore. That's pretty much off. So the danger of our success is, yes, we had this huge community-involved program. We designed this thing. We got this great keg programming thing. Parties went down, right? But we had this pre-gaming problem now with these extreme BACs all across the board with students who wouldn't usually have had that much to drink during the night. So we did not imagine that this environmental shift was going to make a change. So we have to think about what are the consequences and we imagine them as the dragons in the room. How do we deal with those consequences? Or should we think of a different environmental shift, right? So we do have to imagine the dangers if we succeed. What are the plus sides if we concede? Those are easy to imagine. But what could be the downsides if we do succeed? Is it worth it? All right, so to recap, plan strategically. Engage your allies. Because the dragons who would totally dismantle what you're going to do if they're on board and part of the process, all of a sudden, your problems are gone, right? Measure your activity. Be careful. Address the ambivalence. Create a supportive environment for changes. Use asset-based approaches. Don't constantly wait for that next big grant. Figure out how are we going to achieve this success that we want, this behavior change that we want with what we have. And anticipate the dangers of success if you, as you've envisioned it. Super easy, right? So how do we amp up the power of our programming? Nonetheless, we still have to program. It's part of what we're paid for. We have to teach. We have to do other things. How do we make it meaningful? So I've developed this little strategy plan. I've got one here. If you want to go to your other, we're going to spend some time working on it. And what this plan does is really we're looking at what stage of change are the people that we're approaching. So where in that, so if we're talking about alcohol use, right? Where in the period or the in the pyramid are the students that we really want to approach? And what are we using to approach them? So we are mindful always of using a strategy that's going to match the stage of behavior that the student is in, right? And not create a conflict. So we're going to think mindfully about that. And then we're going to talk about, well, how do we move it from an awareness activity up to an engagement activity? How are we going to move that up? And we could easily think about how that could happen. So for example, um, I was doing this presentation at another conference. And we had, uh, I said, well, give me an example of a program that you do that you're not sure that does. Actually, we could do that here. Give me an example of a program that you do that you're not quite sure, that you think could be bigger or better or more effective. The institute. So the institute, this institute? Okay, so um, what is the, the institute attempting to achieve on your so professional growth. So you want greater professional growth is the point. And so your target is, who's the target audience? Faculty and staff. Faculty and, staff. and so, you, um, so you want something that's going to approach 
faculty and staff and help them develop in, in educationally. Okay, and so currently, how is that done? Okay, so a two-day conference. Okay, so we, we've got an activity that's a two-day conference. Now, we've got lots of people at the table who are invested in this process, who fit into this particular process. I imagine there are more people that work with Yavapai College that you would like engaged in this process, right? And so they are maybe ambivalent about whether or not they want to spend their extra time on, um, on their days doing this kind of activity. So we have to think about what's getting in the way, what's their ambivalence. Right? So we think about what's causing the ambivalence and maybe the event itself, maybe they're introverts and they're not into learning this way. Maybe they're more of a hands-on tangent, you know, they need activities that they're engaged in. You know, think about all those different things before we say, okay, maybe this isn't, we're putting all our eggs in one basket, which is this, but maybe what we need to do is diversify the basket. Right? So maybe it's not going to work for everybody, this type of format, but maybe there are other learning styles or other ways, other ways that people can access the same kind of education in a different way. So that might be something that we think about, right? And when we think about, so if we're approaching these folks and we want everybody, we have to think about how we approach them. This works for the people in the room, seemingly. Right? But how do we approach those folks outside? And then the other piece is, what will we do to amp this day up, to make it more involved? How would we do that? What do you think? Any ideas? I don't want to put you on the spot. Yeah? Practice the application. Explain to me what you mean. So, I mean, we're in here for an hour and a half, and it's a lovely session, and mm -hmm. Right? So, in order to actually learn something, you need to be exposed to it more consistently and you have the ability to apply what you're learning. And so, maybe having more emphasis on the application stage. Right. Which is following this session, by the way. I have the workshops and we can practice it with our own activities. So, absolutely. So, that's a great example. So we can amp it up. So one of the ways might be engaging those people who aren't at the table in planning and being part of it. So maybe they're presenting something that's meaningful to them, right? So that might be a way we just kind of nudge it up a little bit. This is a lot of education that's coming down. So if we have a lot of education or opportunity just to network at the table or engage in um, developing things, maybe somebody who wants that type of thing could be at the table. So that way we can move our educational thing from up down to around and round. Right? So there are ways that we can take a simple event that works great. I'm not knocking the event. It's a great event. But, and just amps it right up for greater impact and greater opportunity or chance for change. Right? Awesome. So concepts. So what ideas or concerns, or what concern, ah, oh, I can read. What concerns are, let me go back. What concepts were raised by this presentation? Community. Community. Okay, what else? Engagement. Engagement. Other concepts? Full concepts? Anything? Resistance to change. Resistance to change. So people are resistant to change. Yeah, what other concepts did you get out? Environmental shifts. Environmental shifts are important. Okay, what else? Don't waste your time on stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and don't waste all of your time. Sometimes stupid things are important, but all your time shouldn't be engaged in the stupid things. Absolutely. All right. What? What? Watch out for dragons. Watch out. Well, I would say in, bring the dragons alongside. Find ways to induce those dragons and make them, you know, they get to roast the marshmallows. You know what I'm saying? Give them a roll. What concerns or excite you about these ideas? Yeah. I think I, what excites me is the, the ability to empower students to, to involve them in what we want them to do change-wise. But then also, it's scary to give power to the students. <laughs> so there is that risk that creates that ambivalence, doesn't it? Well, if I give them my program, it might not work out as 
as well, right? But the failure, the cool thing is the failure is the best lesson, right? And that's so scary for us. We want to protect them. Did you have a point? Yeah, thinking about the big picture and thinking about what that, what the culture or norm we want to have and how to create that. Yeah, so how do we get on board with the same big picture, for sure? So how does this all relate to what you've experienced with change work? Does it sync up with what you know? Is it in conflict with what you've learned? How does this fit in? Is it new? And it's too much to be even thinking about? It feels like it kind of raises the stakes a little bit. Um, so you have, you know, maybe what you were doing was maybe on the surface a little bit more because you weren't um, completely invested in what you were doing with your time and your energy and all uh, creating those shifts. And now once you um, commit to doing that, it really, your stakes are a little bit higher. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. It's scary, isn't it? It's a little scary. Yeah. And you had a point? It's just that um, students don't really respond respond to the lecture format and the teacher is an expert as much now as they did years ago and engaging the students really makes all the difference. I, really think. I, I think you're right on. I think you're right on. We were just maybe too polite back in the day. I don't think it ever actually worked out. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were just raised by our mothers to not, uh, to not be rude and say, hey, you're boring the bejesus out of me. <laughs> right? <laughs> So how do these thoughts inform your next steps? These thoughts, these ideas, what's a takeaway? Get more people involved in change. So you can think, how would you do that in your program or what you do when you go back? Um, we're looking at restructuring that bed and we want um, the tutors in the developmental classrooms and student tutors sound to me like a great idea. And this is really giving me more leverage in. So just twisting that ambivalence, you're going right over to the other side. Woo! All right. Win. <laughs> yes. All right. How are we doing? Oh, it's 10 o'clock. I think that's it. But are, are there any other next steps? If you'd like to work on this a little bit more with me and work through the workshop and, and try to think about next steps, we have, um, I, I have the next session here. These are a lot of resources that I have. This is not all original thought. This is me pulling a lot of other people's original thought together. And so uh, these folks are awesome. And uh, their resources and tools are awesome. So I encourage you to, to follow up. This is me. And that is it. <laughs>